presentation is Samantha Manovitz, who is speaking to us from Toronto. Um, I met Sam about four years ago at the Moat Conference, and then last year again, uh, she did an excellent presentation. And so I thought this topic would be particularly interesting for us to, to have. Um, I love you, but don't touch me. So Sam, the uh, floor is yours. Are you with us? Hello, can you everyone see There you me? are, yes, yes. And can everyone see my slides? How are you all doing? We can see you and you're here and hear you. Just okay. start your presentation whenever you're ready. Great, can you see my slide share? Yes. Perfect. So hello everyone, my name is Samantha Manowitz. I am here to present on uh, sex and sensory processing disorder. Now, um, most people know me, at least in the education sphere, on my education around uh, kink, consensual non-monogamy, and abuse prevention and response in these communities, also complex trauma. So uh, sensory processing disorder is a little bit out of my clinical wheelhouse. house. However, um, I have some lived experience with this, and um, we'll go into that a little bit later. So. Uh, this is something that I am creating because I've never seen a resource like this, uh, especially not for adults. And I am hoping that this little snippet will be the start of a much longer conversation and people who are smarter than me doing cool stuff. So hopefully by the end of session, we'll be able to identify at least two types of sensory processing disorder. Uh, recognize um, at least three considerations re regarding SPD, sensory processing disorder in sex. And then this is not going to be in the slides here, but in the drop box, you all will see an expanded version of my slide deck where you can see some selected um, responses of a survey that I conducted, a very informal and not even remotely scientific survey uh, for folks who have SPD. Sam, do you have any way to make your slides slightly larger? Uh, no. Okay. I don't. I'm sorry. Um, okay. All of the all of these slides are available. Uh, Dominic, please correct me if I am wrong. My okay. slide deck is in the Dropbox along with the survey results. So it, every it, it is indeed there, and people can look at them there. Yeah. yeah. So you can see everything there. If, if you can't read that, I suggest pulling it up and following along. Does that work? Sure, carry on. Great. So first of all, hello, like I said, my name is Samantha and I have sensory processing disorder. I was never officially diagnosed, but the symptoms that I have are pretty, uh, you know, pretty unmistakable. And the reason why I started putting this webinar together is I'm actually on a, um, a Facebook support group with adults who have sensory processing disorder. And every month or so, someone will post uh, something on the board being like, does this get in the way of y'all sex life? And usually 50 people respond like, oh my goodness, yes. Why is there nothing here? And so I realized that as someone who is a sex therapist, I could sort of help provide more resources to people like me. And when I uh, initially put this workshop together, I sent out a quick survey thinking I'd get a couple of responses from people just so that I had experiences that weren't mine and something like 53 people filled out the form. So I got way more data than I ever expected and uh, even knew what to do with, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, throughout this presentation, you'll see direct quotes from people who filled out the survey. And everything that I am including has been included with participants' consent. So what is sensory processing disorder? And I've got some little snarky illustrations across. 
So this is from what's called the STAR Institute, which is one of the primary institutes in the United States that works with uh, SPD. So SPD is a neurophysiological condition, physiologic condition, in which sensory input, either from the environment or one's body, is purely detected, modulated, interpreted, and or to which atypical responses are observed. So how many people, you know, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you might be able to um, kind of empathize with the feeling of if you're wearing something that's very uncomfortable and it's fine for a second, but over time it starts to grate. Or if somebody is chewing really loudly right next to you and you have a really emotional reaction. Uh, for folks who have SPD, it's like that, but our symptoms tend to be dialed up to 11. And these are disorders that are most commonly diagnosed and treated in childhood. But so that leaves a lot of adults who, such as myself, who may not have even known that there were other people like them out there, or they've had their symptoms minimized, or once they got a diagnosis, a doctor wouldn't even take them seriously, or would be like, sorry, there's nothing for grownups, that kind of thing. Um, some other things to think about in terms of SPD. So SPD is not actually recognized in the DSM-5, and I don't think it's in the ICD-10 either as a standalone diagnosis. And there's some debate whether it is even a standalone diagnosis or if it's a cluster of symptoms that relate to other diagnoses like ADHD or autism. Uh, most people, when they talk about sensory processing issues, will talk about it in terms of folks on the autism spectrum, but they aren't the only folks who deal with sensory processing issues. Also, as I said before, while there is an increasing body of research on adults, uh, the primary thrust of research and the primary focus on research has usually been on children and adolescents. Um, one of the other things that makes SPD really hard for professionals to tease out is that there are a lot of other diagnoses like autism and ADHD, but not just that. Anyone who has any issue with sensory gating, which we'll talk about in a bit, can have overlapping symptoms or can have symptoms that are, you know, similar to SPD. So there is some debate in the literature and I don't think it has been officially solved. And one person, when I asked, kind of what else do you want me to know? Because I, I asked a lot of uh, open form questions in the survey. One response I got was someone said, I'm just shocked there is a poll having to do with SPD. The doctor who diagnosed me said it's not taken seriously by professionals for adults. So even getting treatment or even having resources for adults to understand their symptoms, I, it, it's, it's very challenging and there are a lot of barriers to access and care. And it is also very hard to find a, an understanding and non-judgmental clinician, which reminds me, Joe, of what you were talking about, uh, talking about asexuals where um, people might try to fix what they think is the problem, but the problem, but the real underlying problem might not only not just be not addressed, but actively shamed and stigmatized and eliminated. Does that make sense? So um, the first person or one of the real pioneers of uh, sensory processing issues was this woman named Anna Jean Ayers, who I believe was a PT. Again, she did mostly research on adolescents and children. And she was the one who coined the term sensory integration. So People who have sensory processing issues have all sorts of disintegration and we have to get everything back in line. Uh, she did a lot of uh, neuropsych research, a lot of uh, the impact of uh, the relationship of sensory integration and what it looks like in the brain. She also uh, researched the impact of sensory dysfunction in children. So a lot of the modern research on SPD uh, comes directly from Anna Jean Ayers. And I believe that there is an institute founded in her name as well. Um, I keep clicking on my computer and I need to click on my iPad. 
So one of the big issues when we have sensory processing issues is what's called sensory gating. So sensory gating is your ability to filter out extraneous stimuli. So if you were whining when you were a kid because something was you thought was too loud or whatever, usually you'll hear from parents or caregivers or friends or teachers like, okay, just get over it, just tune it out. Folks who have issues with sensory gating literally cannot do that. So it impedes directly somebody's ability to modulate or tune out sensory input. Um, I've also read some studies when I was researching this workshop on um, schizophrenia and sensory gating and some of the um, you know, auditory visual hallucinations that people might experience may also be the, the function of sensory gating. So in addition to ADHD and autism, schizophrenia, things like that, where people have, you know, outside reactions to stimuli or stimuli that other people can't perceive, that's where a sensory gating comes in. And sensory processing disorder represents a type of dysfunction with sensory gating. Um, and Anna Jean Ayers and uh, researchers subsequent to her looked at different types of sensory systems. So in order to understand what, what processes are experiencing that dysfunction. So first we have kind of your five basic senses, visual, auditory, olfactory, which is smell, gustatory, which is taste, and tactile system, which is, you know, perceiving physical touch. And Ayers identified the following sensory systems, which are your tactile system, uh, your vestibular system, which is your sense of balance, and then your proprioceptive system, sort of how you move in space, how your joints and your body work. Uh, a lot of physical therapists will work on um, the, the sensory systems that Ayers had identified. And then we have what's called interoception, which is your ability to uh, attune to what's going on internally, which may seem like a weird thing, but it's actually kind of important. Your stomach grumbles when you're hungry. Can you feel your heart rate increase or decrease to let you know if you're calm or stressed or exerted? Uh, your ability to go to the bathroom or tell if you need to poop or pee these are all part of our sensory system, things that we don't always think about on a daily basis. And when we think about the ways that symptoms will impact people, one person said, I love the example of your senses being a soundboard with lots of sliders. Um, with mine, someone went over and slid them all up. I kind of think about the, the off quote, uh, that line from this is Final Tap, like this one goes up to 11. It's like that, but a bad version of that. Um, one of the ways that my SPD will manifest is I have uh, strong physiological reactions to sound. So for me, ASMR like sends shocks of pain up my spine, but that is only one manifestation of SPD and a lot of other people experience it very differently. Um, so there are three basic subtypes of SPD. So one is your sensory modulation disorder. And there are three broad categories of that. So you have under-responsive, over-responsive, and sensory seeking. So over-responsive is like you even breathe on someone and they jump 10 feet out of their skin. Um, this and all of these different subtypes will have their own challenges when it comes to sex. So somebody who is over responsive may get really tired of a lot of stimulation really quickly because for them it slid all the way up. If somebody is under responsive, you know, they may not respond as enthusiastically to foreplay because their senses are a little bit dulled and they may require a lot more sensation in order to feel anything. And then you have folks who are sensory seeking. And these are folks who might be especially struggling now that we're in quarantine, because in order to stay regulated from a sensory perspective, they need constant input, they need that intensity, they need that intensity of experience, which is also why uh, 
folks who have a sensory seeking version of SED might be drawn to things, for example, like BDSM or edge play or body modification, because that type of intense stimulation can um, help them regulate in a way. Then you have sensory based motor disorder. So that's again, your ability to tell where you are in time and space. This is your coordination. So dyspraxia and postural disorder are what those are called. Um, and of course the definition for dyspraxia is immediately slipping my, my brain. But again, this is, uh, the, this is how you think about where you are in time and space. And again, if we think about how this can impact sex, you might not necessarily have such great coordination without physical therapy. Um, your senses might be a little bit off, which might impact your ability to be physically intimate with somebody. And then finally, we have what's called sensory discrimination disorder, which is a difficulty discerning sensory input. Uh, for folks who have auditory discrimination disorders, for example, it might look initially like they're hard of hearing because you'll say something and they'll be like, what? And it's not that they didn't hear you, it's that they didn't fully process or discriminate what had just been said. Or if somebody has a tactile sensory discrimination issue, if you give them a pen, it's like, is this a pen? Is this a pencil? Is this a feather? I may not necessarily be able to tell. And that may also, again, impact our ability to experience intimacy, impact how we receive touch, impact how we respond to auditory foreplay or you know, any other type of sensory play. And I would also point out that these aren't necessarily distinct categories. A lot of folks may have symptoms of multiple subtypes. And there's also a lot of shame and denial around these diagnoses. And people may not even realize that they have SPD. Um, when I was workshopping this with a friend of mine, he was like, yeah, sometimes I really tune out because of this. And I just thought I was being overdramatic. I just thought I hated people. It's like, well, no, that sounds like a sensory issue. Um, and there may also be some cultural barriers for people to even allow themselves to maybe acknowledge that this is a thing that they might want to pursue as something they may or may not have. So now that we've kind of gone through in very broad strokes what SPD can look like, let's talk about sex and what this can look like. And this part comes in part from my own anecdotal experience, but it also is kind of a synthesis of a lot of the responses that I've gotten. And I really recommend that everyone look at the expanded version of my slides to see in more detail and more depth some of the responses that I've gotten. And the responses on that extended PDF are not the entirety of my data set. But those were the ones that I found particularly interesting from people who gave me consent to share their responses. So, you know, if you think about the previous slide that I just showed to show just how varied the diagnosis of SPD can be and just how differently it can affect each and in, each individual person it makes sense that the impact of SPD can wide, vary widely from person to person and day to day. And while most of the respondents of my form or of the survey that I sent out reported a negative impact, I did have a few responses of people to say, this makes my sex life awesome. I come so much more quickly. Uh, my partner loves how sensitive that I am. And so those people do exist. And also the majority of folks who responded and the majority of narratives that you'll see when you look online um, show a really negative profound impact on their sex and sexuality and also on their partners because partners may take it really personally if this person they love and care about doesn't necessarily wanna have sex with them. And there may also be some shame or some feelings of, you know, hurt feelings if one person gets together with a neurotypical person 
and they just try to you know suck up and deal with their symptoms because they really want to impress this person and now they're living together and all of a sudden it feels like they're under pressure to perform when sex can be physically uncomfortable or physically challenging. Um, there are also very few resources, which is why this webinar exists in the first place. And as I said, depending on the person, symptoms can either enhance sex or it can make sex difficult. And sometimes it could do one or the other, depending on the type of touch, the type of intimacy, the type of sex, and also the intensity of the experience that's happening. And one person says, you know, women pass talking about her symptoms. Um, I'm 35 and suffer from so much, but I learned how to fake it, which also comes back to just because somebody looks fine and because somebody looks like they're doing okay, we don't always know what's going on under the surface and we don't necessarily know all of the underlying challenges that somebody is experiencing just to look okay, which can also, again, when talking to a partner, create some strife because it's like, well, you seem fine. You can go to work. How come you don't want to snuggle on the couch with me? Um, how come you don't want to have sex when I initiate? These can be very, very hard conversations and challenges communicating with partners was something that did come up quite a bit in my responses. So here are some more concrete examples of some challenges that people have with sex when they have STD. So it's difficult, difficulty staying focused during sex. So if somebody like me has an auditory disorder and you're living in a large crowded building and you're trying to have sex and your neighbor is blasting obnoxious music, um, you might not be able to gate out the sounds of the music enough to be able to stay present during sex or to stay focused on your partner or stay focused to what you're doing. And this goes across genders. And actually, um, a lot of the respondents to my survey, and I'm not sure if this is just how the snowball sample worked out, but many of them identified as gender non-conforming. The vast majority were cis women and AFAB folks, but there were a number of gender non-conforming, a lot of trans and a couple of transmasculine folks as well. So um, this isn't, specific necessarily to one gender or one gender presentation. It may be really important for people to uh, control their environment as much as possible during sex. So making sure you have uh, control over the time of day, uh, whether the windows are open, how much sound there is, the more control, the better. And sometimes it can also be really hard to discern what types of input trigger the unpleasant symptoms, especially since these triggers tend to be moving targets. And as a result of these triggers and these challenges, the folks for whom their, their symptoms make life difficult, we can develop um, these walls of awful, these kind of emotional barriers to sex and intimacy. And then sex sort of becomes a thing and the more it becomes a thing the harder it is to rekindle intimacy and i think this is something that most couples therapists and most sex therapists might see even with um more neurotypical presenting couples and partners who may come in for therapy and there is also a worry about reaction of partners worrying that they'll hurt their partner worrying that they may not give their partner what they need worry that their partner might not understand or actually shame them. And sometimes those worries are valid and warranted. Uh, okay, so um, when you work with SPD clients, uh, and when I use work, I use work in a very broad sense because I know that we're not necessarily all clinicians or therapists here. For those of you who don't work, you know, who aren't necessarily in those types of helping professionals, these are still things I think that you can think about. And if somebody does have a sensory issue, might help you foster some understanding and may help you be a safe person that an SPD person can come to just to feel heard and to feel seen. So um, 
for clinicians, make sure that you're assessing for environmental sensitivity, even if somebody doesn't say, I have sensory processing disorder. If you're working specifically around uh, desire discrepancies or sexual dysfunction, because again, since this isn't an official diagnosis, this may not necessarily be on somebody's radar, and it may be so deeply stigmatized that people may just automatically assume that they're um, that their senses are just them being difficult or challenging or whatever. Um, and it's also really important to watch for an emotional, what I call an emotional kickback when discussing SPD symptoms, because even whether they're positive or negative, most of us who have neuroatypicalities, you know, I think Joe, you were talking about this when it comes to discussions that ACE folks have around sex, if this has been stigmatized and shamed for so long, when people bring it up, there may be like a flood of emotions that will hit that, you know, it's sort of like this dam breaking open of here are these things that I've just been holding back that I haven't wanted to say. And now all of a sudden I can say that and that may give what I call an emotional hangover. And this is something that I've definitely experienced personally. And it's something that I've seen talked about and posted about on the, the board that um, inspired this webinar in the first place. And make sure that you're giving space for your clients or your friend or your loved one. Talk about how others perceive their experience because a lot of times, just like with the ACE community, it's, you know, they may be fine in and of itself, but it's these expectations of what it means to be a partner, what it means to, you know, walk in this world that isn't made necessarily for folks with SPD. You know, a lot of times outside perspective is more harmful or create or, or than anything we internalized or they can create those internalized scripts that then we then run on. And just like folks who are asexual, they probably also experienced a lot of rejection and minimizing and invalidation by people in positions of power and by people, you know, and, and by healthcare providers. And so when we as clinicians or as friends or as educators have somebody who says, hey, I have these sensory issues or hey, when you play that SMR video, it sends shocks of pain up my spine we need to remember that that person is the expert of their subjective experience. And when you try to challenge it in a way where it's like, um, yeah, but how do you know? Yeah, but do you really feel that? It, it can be uh, actively damaging to the person that you're talking to. And it's also important as a corollary to watch your own assumptions about the presentation because folks who have SPD can come across as kind of belligerent when they're experiencing symptoms. Because from their perspective, there's almost like a fire alarm that is blaring directly into their ear that you can't necessarily see. And someone else is trying to have a conversation with them. Meanwhile, I'm trying to deal with this input over here. The person who doesn't see what I'm reacting to may be like, what the hell is her deal? like that was super rude maybe you should calm down right and again that can be very dangerous and can be very harmful and i think that we need to cultivate not just empathy but empathic attunement in a place of yeah well how do you really know though because most folks with spd are like because i know because i've lived in my body um, one of the things that I, that I found really pleasantly surprising about the responses were, was just the creativity that people found when it came to workarounds during sex, even if that person acknowledged that the only reason that they were having sex was for their partner. Some people were like, I'm doing this and I feel resentful. And some people were like, yeah, I, I'm not always enthusiastic about sex, but I make that choice and it works. Um, a number of folks, not necessarily surprising, and just like you found uh, Joe with asexual folks, uh, BDSM dynamics can allow a lot of excellent workaround because you can have an erotic exchange 
that may not necessarily involve touch or if you're the dom you are in or the ta or the uppercase letter role you're literally in control of what happens in the scene um there was somebody who i had known a few years ago who said that she realized that she had been kinky this entire time uh but hadn't known it before um who has some sensory issues and i think some neurological issues and she would play teacher with her partner because whenever there was sensory overwhelm or she wanted her partner to stop something she would be like okay you need to be disciplined go sit in the corner for 10 minutes and that served a double duty of like allowing her to sort of stay in that energy while also giving her a break from the things that were overwhelming her a lot of other folks talked about having sex during certain types of day times of day um, overwhelmingly people said morning sex for some reason was a lot easier than sex at night um i wonder if there's a physiological reason for that but i didn't get to cover that in my data set um sometimes people talk about powering through or just having to fake an orgasm and that's not necessarily an ideal workaround but for some people that's the only thing that works and even folks who aren't necessarily into BDSM will have what they call like a non kinky safe word so that if something's getting overwhelmed, the person with STD will be like, that's enough. I love you. Stop. And, you know, it's understood that things will change. And one person said, and, and this is a really common um, sentiment that I saw in my responses that I find kind of heartbreaking, which is my partner really does not understand my issue. Therefore, he gets upset about the way that I am. And so folks with SPD can experience a lot of rejection with the people who are supposed to be kind of caring for them the most or the people who they want to look to for support. And at the same time, on the flip side, we also need to understand and have empathy for the kind of neurotypical or less neuroatypical partner because there are challenges on the other end that I think shouldn't be ignored. And so for partners of folks who have SPD, there can be a lot of shame around not wanting to please their partner, not being able to give their partners the orgasms that they want to have with their partner. And it can also lead to an, a paternal dynamic because when uh, you've got too much sensory input, this can lead to a meltdown. And a lot of times the way that folks with SPD respond to their symptoms get interpreted by the larger society as immaturity, even though it's not. Um, the same is true it was for people who have panic attacks, where it's like, it, it looks like a temper tantrum, but it's not. And I think this is compounded by the fact that our culture really wires us for disbelief and inadvertent gaslighting. We're always looking for how is this person trying to take advantage? How is this person trying to put one over? And that does a really huge disservice, in my opinion, to those of us who aren't atypical or who aren't neurotypical. And for those of us who are walking in this world, it's really not built for us. Um, even worse is that symptoms may be interpreted as manipulation tactics. And this is something that I have also experienced in relationships where they're assuming that you're kind of throwing a fit just to get attention, which is also part of those walls of awful that I was talking about that get created around sex touch and intimacy. That, you know, in addition to just the sex itself, both partners will also develop these emotional barriers to even being able to see their partners as sexual beings in the first place. And so when we work with non-abusive partners, um, because if abuse is present, all of this goes out the window and that is the subject for an entirely different workshop. Also, how am I doing on time? Because I can't see the timer. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, awesome. I'm almost done. Okay. So uh, important things to remember are that everybody is doing the best they can with the tools they have. Again, when there is abuse, that goes out the window. We have to remember, and again, this is for not just clinicians to remember, but anybody who has a loved one or partner or partners 
who, who may be experiencing sensory issues. So just because someone gets really frustrated with me because I have a meltdown, that doesn't mean that they are these, this like evil person. It just means they've got their own stuff that's getting in the way of them being able to empathically attune with me. And it's important to remember that all subjective experiences are valid. And if you're doing couples work, it's also important to find ways of maintaining empathy for both or all partners as much as possible. Um, there is a client who I worked with who would have anxiety attacks uh, when they went into sensory overload. And in order for me to do that work, I had to not only hold her experience, but I also had to hold empathy for her partner who was really frustrated and doing things that were causing the other partner to spiral. But if I wasn't able to do that empathic attunement of like, hey, I totally get how hard and frustrating this is. You know, I, I needed, to, we need to acknowledge that so that we can help partners come out of that defensive space and feel heard and validated and seen enough to be the support that they want, that their partner wants them to be. Um, be another thing that's important to remember is that you're watching for your own stuff, like your own internal biases, and that there are going to be perceived emotional labor imbalances. The more neurotypical person will feel like they have to do everything and their partner is just doing absolutely nothing or using their symptoms as an excuse to shirk responsibility. What they don't necessarily see is just how much emotional labor it takes for their partner to be okay. And this is also where it's important for your neurotypical partners to be able to accept influence, to have that influence. That if you treat your partner's symptoms as though they are invalid, you're going to get pushback. It's also important to teach the partners who have SPD their vocabulary for self-advocacy and giving them the language and the tools to communicate to their loved ones and their partners what's going on with them, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. We also need to remember that everyone is allowed to have any feeling at any time for any reason. That doesn't mean that every choice you make based on those feelings is okay. If your choice causes harm, it causes harm. But the feelings themselves are real and present and valid. And then it's also important to allow everybody involved space for grieving and loss because there is kind of a grief around coping with SPD or being in a partnership with somebody has, who has SPD. Because you kind of have to rethink everything you knew about sex. Or as I'll talk about with clients, it's you effectively need to rebuild your intimacy and your sex life from the ground up to accommodate this new information. And that can look different for different people. And so that's what I have in terms of my slides. Here's how you can contact me. Um, I, my email is info at beyondsafewords.com. Not to be confused with Beyonce words, which is what everyone hears when I tell them my website. Um, I put the fun in executive dysfunction. So if you email me and I don't email you back, please repoke me in a week. I promise it's me, not you. Um, also, here's the bibliography, but most importantly, here are some discussions. So some things to think about when you go into your breakout rooms, um, like what were your major takeaways? If you read the responses or have been flipping through the responses, did anything surprise you? And did anything surprise you in this presentation? Another thing to think about, like what might well-meaning partners, loved ones, and healthcare promote, or why might well-meaning partners, loved ones, and healthcare professionals minimize the lived experience of SPD and what other like knock-on or incidental effects might SPD have on intimacy. So thank you all so much. That's my presentation. <laughs>